Okay, good morning. So welcome to this talk on pattern matching. Um, my name is Hanno. This is my uh, colleague Pe Peter. Um, and uh, we are very happy that you have decided to join us today on this ungodly hour. Um, you know what they say in the English language, the early bird gets the worm. So we will do our best to make it worth your time today. Um, and uh, as I said, we'll dive into pattern matching. So let's talk about ourselves for a tiny bit of time. My name is Hanno. I am a, an IT consultant at InfoSupport. And when I'm not behind a computer screen, I'm probably playing guitar or singing, and sometimes both at the same time, um, like this picture at DevOx. I'll return to the music subject uh, in a few minutes, and uh, I'll, I'll explain why. Yes, I'm Peter Wessels. I'm also working at InfoSupport as an IT consultant. I'm very into uh, domain-driven design, so if you're in, uh, into that, uh, look me up in the hallway. Uh, but without further ado, let's head into pattern matching. Yeah, so Peter and I are both involved at InfoSport in, uh, in our internal Java Competence Center, or as we call it, Java Community, a group of Java developers who get together from time to time to research certain new parts of Java. And it, in that research, we encountered pattern matching for the first time. And when we looked at the first installment of pattern matching, I thought that looks like a great small enhancement. So pattern matching, for instance, off in Java 14 could make your code just a little bit shorter. So why not uh, give it a try? But I didn't think, really think much of it until I saw that it was also destined to be extended to be used in other contexts of the language. And that was the moment that I thought maybe it's maybe worth a bit more of my time. So this is the question we want to ask ourselves today. The pattern matching additions to Java, are they just a set of small enhancements, or is it a major feature that could shape the language and the future of how we use the language? So um, we're trying to get an answer to that in the, in the next uh, 45 minutes. And as we start talking about, about pattern matching, for instance, off, which became available in Java 14 for the first time in a preview status, I was wondering who of you has used this already at work or at home? Yeah, a few people. OK, thanks. Who doesn't like raising their hands? <laughs> uh, ah, you do. OK, well, figures. OK, yeah, so uh, uh, for the people who know it already for a bit, allow me to do a quick introduction for the people who, who are here today and have never seen it before. I hope you forgive me for that. Um, like, I sa like I said before, um, I'm really into uh, to music. Actually, Peter is too, because he used to be a DJ, right, when he was in college? Yes. Are you still doing that? Or? No, no. Uh, Oh, he quit. A pity. <laughs> I like the pictures of him with the headphones. And I'm a, a guitarist and a, and a singer also, so I like music. So our domain today will be music stores. It was kind of my therapy during uh, the COVID lockdown because a lot of music stores were closed, so I started programming my own, my own right? Just online music stores. I like them. Um, and for our first example, all we are going to need is a guitar class. So very simple, just a guitar class with a name, nothing fancy. Um, and then we'll get to, to, this, uh, to this mechanism. So imagine we got a product from our database, but we we're not sure that it is a guitar yet, right? And we are wondering, is this product right here, is it an instance of guitar? Um, well, before Java 14, this is what you had to do. Actually, three separate things. Is product a guitar, firstly? Secondly, perform a conversion to a guitar, the cost. And thirdly, declare a variable and bind the value to it. Three very different things. And also, um, you had to repeat the guitar type three times. So duplication. We don't like duplication. How could we improve the situation? Well, pattern matching, for instance, off actually improves uh, the situation. Because in pattern matching, for instance, off, you can reduce this to a single line, like this. Um, and the, the thing you see there is a tie pattern, guitar less pole. And it does three things at the same time. Like I said, it does the test, it does the conditional extraction, and it binds it to the variable less pull. And within the if block, then, less pull will be in scope, and you can use it. So we've encountered the type pattern here. It consists of a predicate that specifies a type with a single binding variable. And this is the first time in the Java language that we've seen the broader concept of pattern matching, uh, which is the conditional extraction of components from objects and then expressed in a more concise and safe way. Well, this is not an entirely new concept because a lot of programming languages support this already. So if you, are, uh, if you have experience with Haskell or C-sharp or Erlang or maybe Scala, you're, you will 
you will know what pattern matching is, and maybe uh, you have used it already. Seems like we've lost the slides, right? Or Oh, there it is. And it's become very purple in the process, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's a colorful morning. A colorful morning. Yeah, it's a new Mac. I mean, uh, display settings. We have uh, yeah? andere coloration. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the guinea pigs. Yeah, it is. Any anyone? <laughs> yeah, you like purple? <laughs> okay. I thought it was better before, but I'm not really <laughs> sure. Maybe we should change the slides into purple then uh -huh. next time. <laughs> yeah, who wants to be? Okay, well, uh, the, the, the point where the purple slice left me is, uh, is the demo of uh, pattern matching for instance of. So let's go to a purple IntelliJ then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this still readable for everyone? Or y You can say no, I, I would understand. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, really unique. You won't forget this talk ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to look at this equals implementation here. Uh, I think a lot of you folks will re recognize this. If you want an equals, implement an equals method, you have to see whether it's an instance of the, the, the same object, right? And if it isn't, you return false, and then you cast it, and then you can compare the fields. Well, with pattern matching, for instance, off, you can reduce this to a one-liner. So let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this also. If we call guitar other and we return this, this is actually our equals method implementation. So this is the this is the type pattern, and it only succeeds when it actually is a guitar, and then it returns true, and then it goes to evaluate the right hand side of the expression, and then it has become a guitar, the, the field other, so you can just access it, its fields right there. So that's uh, pattern matching for instance of. So now if you're going to use this, you do command replace, and every time you do a cast, then you can use this pattern, yeah. and you will reduce your lines and make it more readable, I think. Yeah, so let's get into some details here. So we've got this pattern variable, in this case, the guitar Les Paul. Les Paul is an ordinary local variable, but of course we declared it at a different location, not at the left margin, like a local variable, or at the top of a class, but we declare it in the middle. And also the scoping is a bit different. So we are very used to block scoping, right? So if you've got uh, a method, for example, you define a local variable, the variable will be available to you in the entire method from top to bottom, or if you define it in an if block, it will only be available to you in the if block. Well, flow scoping is a bit different. Flow scoping is defined by the set of places where it would definitely be assigned. So in this case, uh, we are doing a product instance of guitar less full, and if less full is actually a guitar, we call the method is in tune on the guitar right there. Well, that means that at the right-hand side of the Boolean expression, the less full variable is in scope, so there it is available, and also in the if block. But it's not in scope in the else block, because in the else block, Java has decided that Les Paul is not a guitar, but maybe uh, a piano or something, so you can't call any guitar-specific methods on it. This slide, which is again very purple, but um, <laughs> this slide will repeat all the pattern kinds that we encounter during the presentation, so it's kind of a summary. So we'll extend this slide for a bit, uh, and the first pattern we saw was the type pattern, and it looks like that. So can you use this already? Of course you can. Like I said, uh, it was in preview in Java 14. It has been finalized in Java 16. So you, if you are on Java 16 or higher, you can use pattern matching for instance of in your production code also, and um, uh, be sure that um, it won't change in the future versions of Java. So pattern matching for switch was available in Java 17 for the first time. And this is one of the contexts that has been extended, right? So in order to demonstrate this, we are extending our code example for a bit. Hey! hey. hey. 
and just get used to the purple slides. But this is I, like, I like when people <laughs> are excited about my jokes, but this was entirely <laughs> unexpected for me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Great. So let's extend uh, the code example for a bit. Um, Playing the guitar gets a lot more interesting when you hook up some effect pedals, right? So we have defined an effect interface here. There it is. And some implementations. So for example, a delay and a reverb, a tremolo and overdrive, a tuner. If you're a guitarist, you'll recognize them. And if you're not a guitarist, just remember that uh, they are these little boxes that change the tone of your guitar a bit. Nothing fancy. Um, and of course, you need a way to connect them to the guitar. So we have created, in our code example, an amplifier, which is just a big box that creates sound, and an effect loop, which is basically a grouping of effects, um, but also can chain them uh, after each other. And using those classes, we can, we can get to the next um, code example um, that demonstrates pattern matching for switch. So this code example is quite uh, quite large, and it contains a lot of code, right? It's like, I'll show you, it's like 25 lines of code. And the only thing we want to do is, given an effect, uh, make sure that there is a string printed, or that a, st a string is returned. But we have to repeat these else if, else if, right? And we're also doing the casting, so let's apply the thing that we saw a few minutes earlier, pattern matching for instance of, um, and make sure that uh, more of this highlighted uh, business logic, the actual logic, um, is part of the method. When we apply pattern match for instance of, the code example is reduced. And I, I think, if I know by heart, it was a 90 lines of code. But still, a lot of code is dedicated to ceremony, right? I don't like the else, else if repetition at all. Actually, when I see this code, I only want to see the business logic. I want to ma make sure that my intention is drawn to it. Um, now, with pattern matching for switch, and when combining them with switch expressions, we can reduce the ceremony quite a bit. So let's add some cases right here. So this is the default branch, and then it will uh, yield a string unknown effect active. And let's add a few cases right here. I think with this one, we've got all of them. And now we have reduced it to 11 lines of code instead of 25 or 19. So it becomes a lot more concise and also Almost the entire body of the method is just the business logic. So you, you, you're not getting distracted by all these else if repetitions. And um, you can see that when the pattern is matching, for example, the delay one, you can call the DE variable here directly and call the methods on it. So no casting necessary at all. So a question some of you folks might have is, why didn't we just use a type system? Why did we create an apply method that takes an effect? Why didn't we just define an apply method on the effect interface and make sure that all implementations would implement it? Well, we could have done that, but that would not be a very good example for pattern matching, firstly. <laughs> and secondly, um, what if we want to add an operation that doesn't have any meaning for all effect implementations? Some operations are sensible to all effect implementations, like apply an effect or set the volume of an effect pedal or make sure that it contains a set of effects or something. Maybe it's a bit of a stretch. But there are also an, a lot of nonsensical operations. For example, if you ask the effect interface, do you have a tuner active? Well, the effect interface doesn't know. Actually, only the, effect impl uh, the tuner implementation knows about that one, not all the other ones. Um, what about the delay time that I set for my delay pedal? I want to know if it's equal to the room size in my reverb pedal. Um, well, there are two pedals who know about that, and they have to know about each other, but all the other implementations have no idea about this property. Is my current tone suitable to play Pride in the name of Love by U2? The effect interface has no idea. I'm not sure. Sorry? You could have used a default method in I could have used the default method in the interface. I, c I could have, but then, yeah, I could have, sure. Um, what, we would, what we used to do in these cases is um, apply the visitor pattern, I guess, and make sure that a visitor only gets to the, pa the implementations that we needed or that was, that was required. Um, for pattern matching, we could just use an implementation like this, but make it static instead, so that it wouldn't really depend on any hierarchy, and we could just call... <laughs> Leuke 
resultaat zien. Dank je wel. I thought I'm, I'm not going to bring any guitars today, so the sound will probably be okay. <laughs> no sound. Was this the overdrive effect? Yes. Um, I'll just try to speak a bit louder. Oh, don't speak louder. <coughs> okay, yeah, there are a lot of effects thrown at us today. <laughs> we'll just keep going, right? Just keep going. So if we would make this method static, we could just uh, call the operation, wouldn't need to rely on any hierarchy, and you know, we could just make this a class of all kinds of cool behaviors that we could just call from anywhere without having to rely on hierarchies or, or context. So like I said, with pattern matching, you don't need a visitor pattern or a common supertype, which is needed if you, uh, if you uh, implement a, a visitor pattern. Like we said, you could use a single expression and don't need many assignments in the uh, if-else-if if structure. Error ca adding cases is less error-prone because it's just a single line, right? It's more concise and it's safer because the compiler can even check for missing cases, which uh, is also connected to sealed types, but Peter will tell you a bit more about that later. What happens if effect is null? If you switch over null, the default behavior of Java is to throw a null pointer exception, right? Um, and do you want to handle null separately? Then you get you can't do a single return, you have to do if effect is null, uh, I don't know, uh, return something string that says unknown or something, or malfunctioning, but that defeats the purpose of the conciseness and the fact that the business logic is, is so dense right here, so that's why you can also combine case labels like this. You can combine it with the default, or you can put the case null on a separate line if you want to and then it will just return malfunction effect, or I haven't heard of this effect at all, um, so I'm not going to apply anything. Okay, and then there's guarded patterns. That's the one that I wanted to demo for you. Let's see what colors uh, the screen will get this time. Oh, just, yeah, just gray, that's great, I like it. So, uh, let's go to this. So, I have, I have put the code from the slide here also, so it's exactly the same code. Um, and I'm interested in this case, the tuner case. Ooh. What's this? No. I've closed down my IDE. Why? <laughs> Why did I do that? It's early for the IDE as well. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next time we're getting the early bird slot, uh, we're going to say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> please, uh, <laughs> no thanks, right? that's what we're going to say, no thanks, please. Oh, this one was on me, so, uh, you know, uh, I, think we, I think we've had everything now, right? What can <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true, don't tempt it. So, the, the tuner case, I want to look at the tuner case here, because when we get a tuner, we're going to uh, return a string tuner active with a certain pitch, muting all signal, right? But it's a bit of a, a bit of a shame to activate the tuner when the guitar is already in tune. So, what I can do is uh, I can use a guard pattern, which is the when keyword, and I can say uh, case tuner tu when guitar guitar not in tune. So let's reverse that one. <laughs> um, when it's not in tune, and what do I do when it is in tune? Well, I, I can just return an empty string or something, or do nothing, because when it is in tune, I don't have to do anything. So any type pattern here can uh, be, uh, the, you can append a guard pattern to it, and it's just an additional Boolean expression that needs to be true in order for the entire pattern, pattern to match. And if it is true, then it will execute the right-hand side of this case. So that's a cool, a cool feature that we can use Again, here we go. Let's go to the slides again. So a guarded pattern, we've put it on the slide here, also used to look like this, but in the, uh, with, with the double end Boolean expression, but in the, in the final version of the JAP, it looks like this. So it's a when keyword, has become a when keyword. 
it has been added to it, distinguish it from Boolean expressions that are combined with each other. So you can, uh, you can tell the difference and the compiler can tell the difference. Um, and this would be the alternative. If we didn't have guarded patterns, we would have to blow up this case block a bit and do an if statement and make sure that it is not, it's not, not in tune or something, which defeats the purpose of the conciseness again. So this is a, a, a very concise way to extend it with more logic. So this is the second kind of pattern that we saw, the guarded pattern. And you can use it. The entire feature is called pattern matching for switch. Like I said, it has gone through a lot of preview phases. One of the reasons is that this double and percent syntax has been changed to when recently, and they want to gather some more feedback from the Java developer. So it's in a fourth preview in Java 20. Um, so you can use it with the preview flags on. Okay. I wish Peter all the best of luck with the audio <laughs> and the video. <laughs> and he's going to take you, yeah, I do. And he's going to take you through uh, deconstruction patterns. So yes. Thank you, Arno. I think it's the first time Ever for a jab to be in fourth preview, I think. Yeah, I haven't seen it before, so, no. uh, so cool stuff. Right. Cool. Um, so here's where it becomes very interesting, because now we're going to head into deconstruction patterns. And now we have to give this disclaimer, because we're going to uh, describe some features of Java which are not available to you now, but might become available to you. But don't worry, we will tell you which features you can use and which you can't. Um, so if we're going to continue with the example that Hanno presented, then um, you see the switch, uh, this, this switch statement again. And if we want to use a deconstruction pattern, it looks a bit like this. And it looks a bit like the reverse of a constructor. But instead of, instead of constructing an object, you deconstruct an object. And if you're familiar to JavaScript or another language that have this feature, it looks a bit the same. So now we don't have the entire object available to us, but we directly gained access to the variable, in this case, gain. So, um, and you can see it here, we have gain and we use it in our case. Cool. So if we want to use such a deconstruction, we might need to add something to our classes to our records, and to support such a uh, deconstruction pattern, you might need to add something like a pattern definition. So before we had just had a constructor, and now we have a pattern definition to support deconstruction. And note that this is just the class, and we're going to tell you, we're going to show you um, how that works in records in just a moment. And it just works like the opposite of a constructor. We have the uh, input parameter gain, and we bind the value of the field gain to the input parameter. At note, again, this is still, this is not available to you now. They're researching it. Um, yeah, actually, they haven't even decided how they're going to call it. So I saw the latest version of, of, of uh, the vision document on pattern matching, and there they called it public deconstructor. But they have also called it the pattern overdrive, so they're not even sure how to call it. Um, but like Peter said, they're starting with records, right? So because that's yes. a simpler case to implement. Yes, and if you want to add it, um, and we want to see it, because we can show it in uh, records. Uh, God help me. Okay, <laughs> cool. So, <laughs> okay. so demos is always scary, so I hope this will work. Um, so, I can show you uh, how that works with records. So, we have a separate package for that. And for this uh, demo, I want to show you the tuner applier. And the tuner applier is just a normal switch, and uh, which only contains one single case. And uh, we have a special test we want to succeed, and that's uh, this, uh, these two tests. And and what we want to do, if the guitar is in tune, then the output must be no, acti no tuner active, uh, because guitar is in tune. And if it's out of tune, we will return tuner active with pitch 600 and note A. And note, these two are variables we're going to use in our kit. That's way case. out of tune, by the way, 600. But yeah. Continue. <laughs> 440 or something? Okay. 
At least in TGI, it doesn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let's leave it at that. Yeah, let's leave um, it at that. <laughs> cool. Um, so what we can do is actually uh, define a case. Um, and what we, want, we, what we can do with the deconstruction is match for a tuner that can be deconstructed as a, a variable pitch and a node that contains the just simple the, the A in this case. Mm. And, in, and what we want to do is we want to match if the guitar is out of tune because we only want to, uh, to, to uh, apply the tuner when it's out of tune. So we use a garden pattern for that and we say guitar punt in tune and we want to do this. And in that case, uh, we want to return just this uh, string. Cool. I'm very careful, nothing will break. Um, and we have to use string format to make a really nice uh, string. Cool. And what we can do is because we deconstructed our tuner, we can directly have, we have access to pitch and note, so we can directly use it in our case, and then we say uh, pitch, yes, and note, and that should work. Cool. So now we have two cases, one uh, when it's in tune and one is out of tune, and uh, what we can do is run our test, and then I hope it works. It works. So we do have Yay. some luck today. Um, <laughs> so I'll <laughs> head back to the slides. <laughs> and cool. Cool. So um, the benefits are quickly increasing if we add all, uh, if we add deconstruction patterns to all our cases. And we are a bit too lazy to fix the alignment, but um, <laughs> uh, forgive us. Um, but the b benefits are quickly increasing if you look at the cases where you have multiple variables. Uh, it's, it's a bit like going to the supermarket. You, go, you, uh, you don't go into the supermarket twice just to buy two products. You go in the supermarket, buy two products, and then head out. It's just like the, um, the, if you look at the, the tremolo, you directly access the both variable, and you can use it later on in your string. So that's convenient. So, a good question. Um, so, in deconstruction, uh, so in records, they are already generated for you, but supported for classes, y you might need to define it yourself, or they will figure out how they will implement that. Probably the first one, but of course, it's not been decided yet. But records will, will immediately get you deconstructors, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a good question. Yeah. So the question is basically, do you want these functions to be able to do anything, you know, and do a lot of complex logic because this actually stimulates it, pattern matching? Um, yeah. Of course, it's it's debatable whether Java should remain an object-oriented language purely or whether. Uh, we, whether it should make the move to functional. And actually, they're kind of doing both at, at, at the same time right now. So um, I think as developers, we w have to be responsible about what we use because we get more um, capabilities right now. So it means that we have to be stricter in code reviews, I guess. <laughs> uh, but the, yeah, there are more capabilities, and it's not really sure whether Java is functional or object-oriented, both at the same time, I think. and. Uh, so it's a good point. It's something to keep in mind, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's always a, a, a balance, I think. Yeah, you need, yeah, in this language, you need a balance. Yeah. And it will be interesting when they are put into production or into uh, Java version, when we can use them in production, 
to, to see which scenarios which are very suitable for this, this pattern matching and uh, which scenarios aren't and when it's causing problems. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it will be very useful to see them in production. Yeah. So but now a good point. it's just a simple, uh, yeah. simple feature like this. But thanks for the, for the remark. Good, good point. Yeah. Cool. Um, we can use patterns also in conjunction with each other. So we can combine patterns right. and um, and for this case, we combine uh, 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 the patterns. And what we, how this works is, we have an if, and what we do is we check if the is is an instance of an effect loop, which can be deconstructed as a delay and a reverb. And if that's the case, we want to deconstruct both objects and directly gain access to time in milliseconds and um, the name and the room size, and then we can do the equality test. So if you want to do, if you want to do the equality test for is delay, uh, each delay, delay time equal to the reverb room size, you can with these simple three lines. And if you look at, if you want to do it with streams, for example, then uh, it looks like this, and it's kind of a train wreck, and the imperative approach didn't even make the slides. So, um, regarding your question, I think this is uh, this is quite useful, readable code, and I think an improvement over the over this kind of um, code. Um, so, if you know var, you can use it. Yeah, question. I think. Um, That's a good question. Good we'll question. we'll come back to that later. Yes, because that has to do with unnamed patterns, right? Yep. Um, we'll cover it in the slides. So, if we if we forget, come meet us afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Hand <Thanks>. us down. <laughs> okay. Um, um, if you knew var, you can use it if the if you know the type. So we know Telecaster is a time. Hanno does. I'm a DJ, so I don't. Um, <laughs> but then you can use var and um, and leave out the guitar and leave out the type definition. And uh, they are thinking about a VAR pattern uh, where you um, change the, um, the type of the fields into VAR and then you say, okay, I don't care about the types of these fields. So the benefits are of a deconstruction pattern. You have some better encapsulation. A case bench only receives data that it actually references. Um, and you have some more elegant logic if you look at the last example where you use them in uh, you combine patterns with each other. And that's uh, a deconstruction pattern, and um, that's very cool, and we have seen the four pattern we can use. And this is the big disclaimer, when you can you use it? Well, you can use deconstruction patterns in preview, the yeah, second preview in Java 19, so they aren't available to you now, but if you want to use them, put your ID, update your ID first, because if you're using DLA, you have to update it, and then you say, okay, I want to use preview functions. Yeah, it will probably be second preview in Java 20, but they haven't really, uh, yeah, haven't announced it yet, so we can't put it on the slide yet. You will probably see, but they will announce it next week or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. so um, pattern matching plays very nice with uh, sealed types and records. We have already seen quite a lot, so I will go into quick, uh, into sealed uh, types and records very quickly. Um, this demo isn't that spectacular as the previous one, so we're going <laughs> to skip that for now. <laughs> and what we wanted to show you, and what I'm going to tell you, is that um, it plays very nicely pattern matching with uh, sealed types because you can, you can, if all the implementations of effect are covered, then you don't need a default branch anymore, just like you expect. Um, and like we mentioned, records um, will be the first installment of pattern matching because if you use patterns, you get the implementation for all these convenience methods. Um, not really convenient, but they are convenient to you. Um, <laughs> and you have all these kind of methods, and therefore it's, it's a very logical step just to uh, generate an implement, implementation for the deconstruction pattern. 
Um, and something new we just discovered this week, I think it's out for, for a couple of weeks now, uh, that you can also use pattern in, an, an, in a for loop, and then you uh, want to, if you have an, an array, then you can um, use patterns in that. Yeah, it just been announced in Java 20 for the first time. Yeah. yeah. So during, when we give this talk, we all, every time have to update all the feature status. So <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah, think of a talk they said, then you can give it 10 times. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, seal types are vinyl. You can use them. You might use them in production right now. Uh, completeliness in conjunction with record patterns are in three, uh, third preview, and record patterns are still, they are still working on that. Question there. Question, yeah. What's the advantage of using a get statement? Um, the what's the advantage? So the question what's is? The advantage of the reconstruction pattern uh, over uh, a simple get statement? Yeah, so um, the, the, the question is what is the advantage over, of a deconstruction pattern over a getter? Um, if we use deconstruction, we directly gain access to the variable and not the entire object. So like the benefits I show you on the slides, you have some better encapsulation. So you don't have, if you don't need the entire object, you don't get the entire object. And it's more, I think it's more readable because you see which variables are, are available to you directly instead of looking into the case, uh, into the string to, to know which getters are called and now you know which fields you're gonna use. Cool, so yeah. without, further if, uh, without further ado, um, let's hand to head into better serialization. Yeah, sure, thanks Peter. Okay, we need a big disclaimer for this one. I called it Here Be Dragons. Maybe you've seen this in code comments sometimes uh, by, written by your colleagues. This is also appropriate place to, to, to say here be dragons because these are very plans for very much in the future. Um, just a direction where pattern matching could be headed. Um, and we again, we've based uh, the, the content on a, a vision document written by a few architects at, uh, at Oracle, but we can't be sure if they will appear in the language exactly like this or when they will appear. But it's good to have like a uh, to view the horizon and see, well, this could become possible in the future, so that's cool. Um, so we have seen that a deconstruction pattern is in a way an opposite of a constructor, because a deconstruction pattern gets a populated object and breaks it apart into multiple fields, Well, the constructor obviously does the opposite, gets a set of type fields, puts them together into a populated object. Um, and this is an important observation when we think about serialization. Well, we have to address a few things here. Serialization is a very important feature, right? And it really helped Java become more popular in the late 90s because of its application in remote method invocation, for example. If you can remember that, I was in high school, so I don't. But um, many people really hate the current implementation of serialization. The, uh, the Java architect Brian Gutz, who worked at Oracle, uh, said in one of his talks, even Gollum from Lord of the Rings hates serialization. Well, he hates everything, so. Uh, but also serialization, apparently. Um, and why, why does Gollum hate it? Why does, do a lot of people hate it? Because it undermines the accessibility model, because it uses field scraping, and it uses all kinds of reflection magic for that. So if you declare a, a variable private, well, the joke's on you, because serialization can still access it. Um, serialization logic is not readable code, at least not by default. You have to over override some very, some very specific methods, read object, write object, or something. I always forget what they are called. Um, and you can't really read the code or put it through static code analysis or, or that kind of things, or test it. Um, and it bypasses constructors and data validations. So when you create a, an object using serialization, it doesn't use the constructor at all. And if you are putting data validation into your constructor, for example, this number cannot be ne negative, for example, we'll just bypass it. You can just put a negative field in there. So that's why people don't like the current implementation, but using pattern matching serialization could improve quite a bit. So let's say we've got the effect loop class right here, familiar to you already. Um, what if we want to serialize or ser deserialize this? Well, um, we could, of course, use a constructor and then add a deconstruction pattern like this, and add this pattern definition to serialize it. So let's assume that 
the serialized representation of this effect loop is a string and an effect array, like we see, well, like we see there in the parameter list. And um, we could just create an overloaded constructor, for example, for the deserialization to convert the string and the effect array back to an effect loop object. And if you would want to add any data validation, you could add it here. Well, then add some annotations, right, to make sure that the intent of the code is clear. So deserializer on the overloaded constructor, serializer on the deconstruction pattern, like this. And now a few of the drawbacks that I mentioned earlier, we have drastically improved on them because we no longer undermine the accessibility model if these methods are used for serialization and deserialization. The code has become readable, so you can test it, you can put it through static code analysis. You don't any, any longer, you don't any longer um, bypass constructors because you actually use the constructors to make sure that the object gets uh, serialized and deserialized again. So this will be a lot better. Of course, there are some challenges. One of the challenges is this is just a vague idea for in the future. And a lot of other stuff regarding pattern matching has to be built. For example, uh, destructuring uh, classes instead of records. And how do you support multiple versions of a class? Well, one of the ideas to solve that is to um, really introduce these annotations and give them a property version so you could annotate multiple pattern definitions or multiple constructors like that to make them support specific versions of the class. Well, the feature status is, I would say, murky, <laughs> uh, because there's just an exploratory document towards better serialization. So if you like this subject, follow the link and uh, read, it, read up about that. Uh, we will tweet the slides later on on our Twitter profile, so uh, you can uh, follow the link later or take a picture if you want. It's up to you. And now we get to some uh, future expansions just in line with the serialization, because that's also a future expansion. I'll start with a future expansion that I think is in the near future, because a JEP draft was published uh, a few weeks ago. And most of the times that means that it will be targeted for a specific Java release, so like Java 20 or Java 21. So let's start with this one, unnamed patterns. And this has also got to do with the question that the gentleman just asked us about limiting the scope of your pattern variables. Um, so, do you remember our VAR pattern example that Peter showed you? Uh, the, I've put it on the slide again. In this example, uh, the compiler can infer the type, right? So, the time in milliseconds is probably uh, a primitive int, but you can just put VAR there and uh, the compiler will infer the type for you. And the reverb the, uh, took a VAR name, which is probably a string, and a VAR room size. Well, when you look at the implementation of the method, um, it looks like we're not even using the var name, right? We are comparing the room size to the type in milliseconds. So right now, this if branch receives more information than it needs for the current logic in there. Um, and you have to make sure that, some, that the, the, the pattern for a reverb, like here, matches both fields because it's uh, a record and the record contains two fields. So the generated deconstruction pattern expects a name and the room size. But what you can do in the future is use an unnamed pattern, which is currently uh, symbolized by this underscore character, which just means I don't really care about the first field. I'm not going to use it anyway. Give me that second field. And uh, in this way, you can, uh, in future versions of Java, probably the, the Java 20 or 21, you can, uh, you can use unnamed patterns like this for v values that you don't care about. Well, this is one use case, but there are other use cases. What if you had this switch expression like we had on the slides before, and notice uh, that the case for the effect loop, which I have singled out right here, is a bit more performance heavy. Of course, it's all child's play because it's just a stream and it's a recursive call to effect apply, like you can see. But yeah, what if this uh, effect loop is uh, 200 elements long or 2,000 or well, use your imagination, right? Um, and could there be a case in which you don't want to recursively call the apply uh, method for all, all the elements in this effect loop. Well, I could think of a case, well, as, as a guitarist anyway, if the effect loop contains a tuner, I don't really care about all the other effects because a tuner's pedal function is to mute all signal and just make sure that you can tune your guitar. So I don't care about any reverbs or delays or octaves or uh, whatever, what have you that are in the effect loop. So what you could say, is if, uh, if I, I can match a, a pattern on this tuner right here, because it contains a tuner, and 
you know, any other field right there, just uh, provide a different implementation that says the effect loop contains a tuner. Um, what, what does it say? Muting all signal? Yeah, muting all signal. And if it doesn't, um, and if it doesn't has a have a tuner inside of it, so that will be the second branch, we could choose to execute the performance heavy branch. So that's an uh, idea to use unnamed patterns to make sure that you could skip performance heavy parts. So that's kind of cool. Um, so this is the final pattern kind, unnamed pattern, right? Uh, and we finished the slide up. Yeah. Yeah. And this is kind of saying, okay, I recognize that I sometimes cannot do it, so let's do it like this. Mm -hmm. At least I can ignore part because I made a wrong guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Wouldn't it be simpler to please just use what's already there, and instead of introducing something like deconstruction patterns, do gets because getters already have a predictable and standardized Mm -hmm. So you could just let those names refer to getters. I think we, we, uh, the next time we, uh, we bring Brian Gutz with us, because <laughs> these are really good <laughs> questions. Um, and, and, they, and, and therefore, the, this is also uh, the field when um, they are trying to collect feedback on this kind of stuff, and, um, and, um, and also check if there are use cases for that. But I agree with you, you maybe have an, uh, uh, a problem somewhere else. Well, yeah, but uh, there's another answer to your question also. Oh, a good answer to any question here is bring Brian Gutz with you, so that's what we'll do next time. But uh, another answer is, um, so with records, the, the, the pattern definition is generated, right? And it all, all, always matches on all fields of the record that you have defined in your record. But um, probably with classes, you can define your own pattern definitions, and then you can just leave out a few fields if you would like. So in this case, if delay was a class, a regular class, I could have left out the first field in the pattern definition and just provide it for the second field. So there is a way to to sculpt the fields that you want to match. Basically, gets, get us instead of using empty pattern in a way, you can avoid it, right? It's dissolved in the in the times of the empty pattern that you can yeah. avoid. Yeah. So I think that the, 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 the advantage here is that you can limit uh, scope of certain combinations yeah. of your, mm. of your, of your, of your yeah. Yeah, and there's one thing I would like to add. It's not forbidden to use getters after this feature has been completed, right? <laughs> so you just get a bit more choice, and uh, and you can still use getters if you want. It's just another capability that might match your needs a bit more. So freedom to the developers, right? Um, unnamed patterns. It's a JEP draft, like I said. It hasn't been targeted to a Java release, but most of the times when they create a draft, it's like the, the next or the next after this one version. So. We'll try to keep track, uh, track of it for you, and we'll probably tweet about it when it's been targeted. So follow us, and you'll be in the loop about it. Um, we've done so many questions already during our talk, and we, would, we wanted to finish five minutes early, but that's not going to happen. I see that we've got like one minute left, so I'm going to skip a few slides. Uh, no, one slide I'm going to talk about, and then I'll, we'll wrap up. I want to talk about pattern bind statements, which is also a feature in the future, and you can see about the double underscore syntax right there, because that's what they do at Java, the Java architects when they are proposing a keyword, but they're not sure that it's going to be this one, so they've chosen let for the, for the time being. But they want to make sure that you can use pattern matching in more context. So we've seen right now the instance of, we've seen switch, we've seen enhanced for even, and they also want to support in the future a pattern bind, sta bind statement that you can just, within a method body, for example, Say let reverb pattern is reverb, and then in the lines below that, do something with name and room size. These variables will then be in scope in the remainder of the method. And they'll probably even extend it to this. What if the pattern match fails? What if it's not a reverb? You can execute an else branch and throw an exception or whatever you want. So, another context for pattern matching in the far future, right? Let's skip a few slides to, uh, to wrap the, uh, the presentation up. Array patterns also <laughs> far in the future. Uh, one thing I would like to point out in the other ideas slide is deconstruction patterns for arbitrary classes. That's the one that we're really uh, waiting for because when you can do it with records, if you can do it with arbitrary classes, then it becomes a lot more flexible and useful. So 
that's a very good idea that we hope is going to be in Java very soon. To summarize, these are the pattern contexts that we've, saw, we've seen in the, in the talk. You can use patterns in the instance of predicate. You can use it in a switch statement or expression like this. You can use it in an enhanced for. And later on, probably also as a pattern bind statement, like I told you. I think you're, the conclusion is hanging in the air. You can feel it coming. <laughs> but the, before the presentation, we asked, is it a small enhancement or a major feature? We think it is definitely a major feature because it plays out over several versions of Java. It allows us to do all kinds of stuff we couldn't do before. It improves switch expressions. Destructuring objects becomes more simple. And it can simplify and streamline much of the code we write today. Like we already concluded with the questions, it gives us a lot more opportunity to um, make sure that fields are used in the, in the right way. Or we can just keep using getters. It's up to you. You're very free to do whatever you want. We have to conclude, though, that it is a major feature, and it's very exciting times for the Java language. And we are really looking forward to using all this good stuff in production as soon as possible. Thanks for your attention. All our code is on GitHub. And if you want to keep track of the slides or any other jabs related to pattern matching, you can follow us on Twitter or Mastodon. Do we have Mastodon already? It's kind yes, of a, I have. It's kind of a big thing, right? Yeah, I'm, I have. Oh, Peter Wessels and Hannah Notify on Twitter or Mastodon, whatever uh, you think is more fancy. And thank you for your attention and your very good questions. I really like them. Well, thanks. Very much.